So good, good morning, everyone. <laughs> good morning. I'm Pierre Noiza. I'm a co-founder of Pemium. Pemium is a, the company behind uh, Bitcoin Central. Bitcoin Central is one of the earliest uh, Bitcoin exchanges. It started in January 2011. Uh, it's, it ran from January 2011 through uh, April, uh, last month, uh, April 2013. Um, we were the first uh, to uh, sign a partnership with a banking partner, uh, what we call uh, in Europe a payment institution, which is the uh, European equivalent of a uh, uh, MSB, money service business. And uh, we suspended the service uh, last month for two reasons. One is we are switching uh, banking partners. Uh, and, and the other is we, there were uh, cyber attacks last month, you may have noticed, DDoS attacks and, and cyber attacks. Now we'll explain uh, the reason why this led us to suspend the service. So I will cover uh, why we're in Bitcoin, because we have different backgrounds. There are, there are three co-founders in Premium. We come from uh, the software uh, industry and the uh, telecom industry. I personally have a background with a large telco company I was working with on uh, NFC payment before I founded uh, Premium. Um, and I will tell you a bit about the H Bitcoin exchange business, if we can share our experience about that with you. So this is a picture of uh, the 2011 uh, Bitcoin conference in Prague, uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, I put it up because this is not the speakers of the conference, this is the entire attendance of the conference. Um, and this shows you uh, how long, uh, the, the, the way that's been uh, uh, the, the, the achievement of, of Bitcoin in, a, in less than two years, uh, because I understand there are over 2,000 attendees this year in San Jose. So, uh, and some of the people there are in the room, I can see. And you can see Rick Falkvinger, who is the uh, Swedish uh, founder of the uh, uh, Pirate Party in, in, Switzerland, in Sweden. So it, it's, uh, it was a fairly political conference. This conference is evidently more business-oriented. I understand there is a more political conference coming up later this year. Uh, so the, we are fully aligned with the, uh, the state mission statement of the, of the uh, Bitcoin Foundation that you can uh, see here. Uh, we've been, uh, uh, I have I've been uh, interested in uh, cryptocurrencies for a long time. Uh, I knew about Ripple before I knew about Bitcoin. Um, and um, essentially we are uh, entirely aligned with the uh, uh, Bitcoin Foundation. We think it's a great initiative to have this uh, non-profit organization uh, for, and this conference uh, is really a big success that, that can be attributed to this initiative. So what, what is it we do at Pemium? We do a, uh, what you'd call a transaction platform. What's a transaction platform? It's a, basically an accounting system where you can handle deposits and withdrawals and where you can attach payment means, uh, be it a, a mobile application or a uh, credit debit card. It's essentially a prepaid payment system. On top of this transaction platform, so that's dealing with euros um, and Bitcoin. On top of this uh, transaction platform, you have what's commonly referred to as a Bitcoin exchange. That's the capability to uh, handle a order book. So to uh, post, uh, sell and buy orders and the matching engine that will uh, match, sell and buy orders. And last but not least, there is a, um, an online wallet and a mobile wallet. So that's the ability to send and receive payments while on the go, obviously, and that's um, through an API to the transaction platform. So the three elements are really uh, important pieces uh, of, of the puzzle because without the exchange, you don't have the, uh, the, the, the current exchange rate and liquidity to have a mobile wallet that, for instance, will process the payments to the Bitcoin network. So you have to depend on a third-party Bitcoin exchange. So at Premium, we think it's important to have both Bitcoin exchange and the wallet together. So I want to talk about uh, briefly about two other services that we tried and stopped. Uh, and maybe there are many people in the room that use Install Wallet. Install Wallet is a great idea that was invented by uh, a young uh, German developer named Jan von Vorberg. Uh, Jan. 
Um, and uh, we acquired the, the idea from Ian uh, last year, early last year. We developed our own code base for Install Wallet and we operated it through, uh, from uh, early last year through uh, April uh, last month. Uh, so with InstaWallet, it was probably the quickest way to get a Bitcoin address. For a newbie, you'd go to instawallet.org and there you have a Bitcoin address because the Bitcoin address is linked to your hidden URL. You're getting a secret URL that you keep for yourself and that's your key to the, to the address. So it's a very simple idea. So it, it's a very uh, native Bitcoin service because it's something, not something you can easily do with any other payment system. Um, and it was very successful. It was, uh, in fact, uh, hugely successful, but it was sometimes used for the wrong reasons. So people would use it to mix funds uh, that were not necessarily all, always uh, legitimate, uh, because you, you'd send Bitcoins to this address and you could, when you withdraw, obviously it's not coming from the same address because it's a hosted, what we call a hosted wallet. You had the shared pool of addresses um, with the other users. So uh, when you send money to this wallet, and you take the money out, bitcoins out, then your, your, your funds are mixed. So people were using it for that. Um, and also they were using it for a uh, large amount of bitcoins. Uh, and it's, it was not meant to do that because it's a, it's a very unsecure way of storing bitcoins because your, your URL is a secret, is your secret. Uh, so you have to back up your URL like you would back up your private keys. But URL sitting on, on your PC is not a very secure location, evidently. So uh, you, you, you don't want to store large amounts of, of, of Bitcoins on such a wallet. And uh, in fact, we discourage people from doing that, but still they, they were doing it. So that led um, Insta Wallet to uh, become a honeypot for, for hackers because it's a hot wallet. Uh, and uh, eventually this happened. Uh, we lost a few thousand Bitcoins. Uh, we are still solvent, so we will refund all the Insta Wallet users. In fact, if they go to their URL now, they are getting a, a form to claim their funds. So they, this will happen in the next few weeks as we uh, process the, the, the claims. But uh, for us, it was a learning experience because uh, it shows how difficult it is to secure a hot wallet with a considerable amount of Bitcoins on it. And I would strongly advise uh, any Bitcoin business to do the same. Uh, you want to do uh, almost everything in cold storage, and that's what we are going to do going forward. The other service I want to talk about briefly is InstaWire. It was very, uh, it was also what I call a Bitcoin native, uh, Bitcoin native service in the sense that uh, it's something you can do with Bitcoin technology uh, and not with an, uh, any other, uh, easily with any other uh, payment means. So essentially what you do is wire money to InstaWire and in the comment field of your bank wire, you would put your Bitcoin address. And as a result, you would get uh, your Bitcoins back to your Bitcoin address immediately on, with a spot price of, of the Bitcoin when we received the wire. So it was a very simple way for people to get Bitcoins without having to go through an order book. Because as someone said before this morning, uh, buy and sell order is not something people are familiar with usually unless uh, they trade the stocks. Uh, and, and, and as a result, it was a great way, again, for, for newbies to get their first Bitcoins. Um, but then <laughs> there was another problem. The first problem was some scam, scammers were using it um, to scam people. Uh, they were using it as a payment means. So they, were, they would say to, people, to unsuspecting customers, send, send a wire to my, to my account, which is in fact what was the InstaWire account. And they, and they would specify that you just put this uh, code in the, in the comment field of the wire. And that was a, a Bitcoin address. So the, uh, the scammer would get the Bitcoins and would not deliver the goods. So uh, that's what happened. Uh, the first thing that we discovered and that led us to believe, to begin to doubt about InstaWire as a service. And uh, the other thing that happened is the VAT problem because what's the status of, of a uh, Bitcoin? We don't, we don't know yet. <laughs> Uh, it's a commodity. If it's a commodity, maybe there is VAT tax on it. That's at, at least what the tax administration told us. So as a result, we had to provision a tax liability, and that, uh, that's uh, VAT tax is 20, close to 20%. Uh, so we, the price was going to the roof. So this was not a sustainable service, we, we thought. So for the time being, those two services are uh, suspended, and uh, we'll eventually resume them, but probably in a different configuration. So. Switching back to what we do uh, as a Bitcoin exchange, and we just want to 
remind that perhaps not everybody in the room is familiar with payment systems. So there are basically three categories, in fact, two legacy categories. The first is what we'd call a four corner payment system. That's typically a, a card payment scheme where you, you have a bank, the, the merchant has uh, it's their bank and the two banks will clear the transaction. Um, the three corner situation is typic typical of PayPal or American Express or uh, Amazon coins. Uh, it's one central organization and you register to this uh, system. The, the merchant is also registered and, and you have a three corner uh, payment uh, transaction. With Bitcoin, we have a new dimension that's peer to peer, true peer to peer transaction where if Alice uh, has a, uh, is a full node uh, of a Bitcoin network and she wants to pay Bob, who is also a full node of the Bitcoin network, then they can be in a true peer-to-peer true -peer transaction. So they would send a transaction message. In three seconds, uh, Bob will get the transaction message. He, he knows he's getting paid by Alice. Uh, he, he can wait for confirmation, but that's uh, not, not necessar necessary if, they, if he knows Alice uh, beforehand. Uh, or if it's uh, j just digital goods. So there are, there are plenty of advantages, obviously. So what, what's important to uh, understand is that with Bitcoin, you are not losing the other two options. We, in fact, they are still there. If, uh, <clears throat> if Alice is using a hosted wallet, like uh, she's using a Bitcoin exchange as, as a um, hosted wallet, then we are in a three-corner situation. In fact, the wallet will, Alice's wallet will pay Bob uh, Bob is a full node, Alice is using a hosted wallet, we have a three-corner situation. So we, we have a three-corner payment transaction with Bitcoin, uh, and we can have the same if both Alice and Bob are using a hosted wallet, different hosted wallets. We have a four-corner uh, payment transaction, so we are not losing anything, but we have the peer-to-peer -peer on top of it. And when PayPal talks about uh, PayPal talks about peer-to-peer -peer payment, in fact, it's, uh, it's propaganda, it's not really peer-to-peer, -peer. it's just customer-to-customer, -customer, which is very different. It's a three-corner transaction. So that's uh, just to illustrate the difference between a peer-to-peer -peer network and a server-based network. What's, this is showing just the resilience of a peer-to-peer -peer network. Yeah, there is no single point of failure. Uh, if one node goes down, it does, doesn't matter. The, the network is still operating. Um, and, and the performance of the network is just amazing. As uh, I keep mentioning how fast the Bitcoin transaction can go from, uh, say, Europe to Asia. Um, it's, it's almost it's a matter of seconds, so it's really a high performance network today and very secure because of the hashing power. Uh, okay, this is another aspect of Bitcoin that's uh, extremely interesting for the payment sector is the, uh, the fact that Bitcoin is, in, is a de facto standard. It's a de facto standard for uh, wallets, payment, payment means to inter, in, interact with each other. Today when we, you are with PayPal, you can only pay someone who has a PayPal account. Uh, same for the competitors of PayPal, and that's why the competitors of PayPal are, are all dying, because there is no way they can uh, compete with the... Uh, they hit the wall of something called the network effect, and the network effect is playing in favor of PayPal, and that's why PayPal is so successful. Uh, but uh, you, you have a, what we call a closed loop also. It's really a, in, in the three-corner situation, you are in a closed system. With Bitcoin, it's a, it's a game changer because all of a sudden, if they have a Bitcoin plugin, they add a Bitcoin plugin to their to their wallet. These people, then all of a sudden, they can pay each other. So that that's something they that that makes Bitcoin a true game changer for the payment sector. Okay, so going back to a Bitcoin exchange, <clears throat> this is showing basically what uh, what it looks like in our vision. So on the, on the left, you can see there are several ways to load the account. Um, the, wire, the wire transfer is still the, the, the mainstream uh, uh, fashion for, for, for deposits, uh, uh, primarily because of the charge, chargebacks problem with cards, with uh, debit or credit cards. There are chargebacks with wires, by the way. Uh, you have a window of up to eight days, I believe, in, in Europe for a customer to uh, count, uh, challenge uh, the, the wire he just made. So you have to be aware of that. And, and uh, so we don't have zero chargeback with wire transfers, but it's still much better than a, a credit card based uh, deposit. And, and uh, we have also the cash deposits with uh, companies like Ucash or ZipZap. Um, then there are different there is a different set of uh, problems with uh, cash deposits, but essentially they are not free. Wire deposits are free, 
uh, at least in Europe. It's, people can, in the SEPA zone, they can send a wire without any charge. Uh, cash deposits, there is a cost attached to it uh, for the collection of the cash and the, the logistics of the cash. Um, so this is loading your account on the platform. Uh, from there, you can uh, put a buy or sell order for Bitcoins. You can use the mobile app to, uh, to pay um, Bitcoin merchant. So how does that work? You have a, a wallet that's showing uh, your balance. You are sc scanning a QR code that's uh, presented by the merchant. And the merchant is receiving Bitcoins. He can cash out uh, with uh, a payment processor like BitPay or like us. Um, the nice thing is we don't have to have a, a business relationship with a merchant. Uh, unlike the other payment system, there is no uh, pre-existing business relationship between the wallet and the accepting system. And that's, uh, again, referring to the de facto standard situation we have with Bitcoin. Since it's a standard, we don't have to agree in advance with the merchant um, as to how he is going to accept the Bitcoins. Uh, and last but not least, there is the card. Uh, we had a MasterCard program uh, uh, in the works with our banking partner. Uh, eventually, it got nixed by MasterCard because uh, the banking partner put uh, too many times the word Bitcoin in the application. Uh, so next time, we'll be more careful to make it look like a regular credit card. Uh, in fact, it is a regular credit card. The only difference is your fiat currency account can be topped up by Bitcoins instantly via our transaction platform. But really, it's, it's like any other credit card. So there, there was no need to mention Bitcoin in the application. So that's, that's food for thought for next time. <laughs> um, and there is, so that's for what we do on the top. Obviously, the, there is, we're exposing an API for people to develop their own wallet. Uh, so we can supply our own uh, white branded wallet uh, to uh, people and they can, or they can use, develop from scratch and, and use our API to hook up to the platform. Um, and with it, uh, you can really pay uh, online. You can pay in the shop, although I think this is perhaps further down the road for, for merchants to accept Bitcoins in the shops. And uh, obviously you can pay another Bitcoiners. Okay, so <clears throat> the Bitcoin exchange is seen by us really as a payment gateway to the Bitcoin network because that's, where, uh, that's your way of uh, converting back and forth between fiat and Bitcoin. Uh, so if you want to send money to, uh, across borders, you will uh, use the Bitcoin network. If, uh, if you are sending money to another premium uh, service user, then there is no need to go through Bitcoin. You just do a book a ledger entry uh, in fiat. So that's, uh, that's why we see the Bitcoin exchange really as a complementary to, uh, to uh, the, the payment gateway function of the platform. So that's uh, the card I was referring to. Um, th that was our design, uh, tentative design for the card. Uh, the, the reason you see Petunia as the brand uh, is Bitcoin Central obviously has Bitcoin in, in the name. So we needed a, a more neutral name for, for the banking uh, industry uh, and certainly on the card. It's also true for the App Store, for Apple. Apple doesn't like Bitcoin. So they, they will reject uh, an application if it has uh, Bitcoin uh, referring to it uh, in, in the description of the app or in the name of the app. Or, so so you have to, we have to rename the app. So we named it Petunia um, <clears throat> and we got in. <laughs> um, so again, I was mentioning that we, we were talking to um, retail uh, companies uh, about having their own wallet. I th they are considering it very seriously. Uh, the uh, recent events uh, kind of put the, uh, this um, in a suspended mode again. Um, but I think that we will be back in talks with them uh, pretty soon uh, when the dust has settled. So the Bitcoin wallet is really, uh, has really three functions. Uh, you can uh, uh, again, uh, pay any uh, Bitcoin Bitcoiner. You can pay an online merchant with any checkout system, Bitcoin compatible checkout system. So we know a lot. We heard BitPay. We are an alternative to BitPay in Europe because BitPay is dealing mostly in, in dollars today. 
Um, and, and there is also the possibility to use a classic uh, credit card if, because obviously not all merchants in the, in the shop, you, you still need the credit card in most, most places. So I want to uh, emphasize that the, uh, the advantages of the Bitcoin technology don't stop at the, uh, um, the, the, the money transfer function and the, uh, the, you know, the seamless uh, transfer of money from across borders. It's also a great way to check out online. And uh, that's something I can uh, explain w briefly here. Um, essentially what you do is you scan a QR code with your mobile, uh, your, your smartphone. Uh, you click OK. And that's it. That, that's, a, that's the online checkout with Bitcoin. Um, how does that work? I take an example of, digi first of all, with digital goods. So I'm taking a boring uh, financial paper, um, and they have, they have paying articles. So if you want to read a particular article, you may have to pay for it. So you click read more, and you are presented on the left. You can see a traditional checkout. Today, what they are proposing is basically a seven-step checkout, uh, where you have to fill out a, a very lengthy, uh, a painful form, uh, and you have to enter your, your, your credit card information for an article that's probably worth 50 cents, and it's, it's not worth your time. So essentially, you're not buying the article. You, are, you, you just go, and, and you, move, you move on, and you, you don't buy the article. Uh, with Bitcoin, it can be really a game changer because in this case, I hit read more and I'm presented with a QR code. All I have to do is scan the QR code with my smartphone, hit OK, and I can download. I have a download link. So now I'm, I'm buying an article, a 50 cent item on, online because it's, it's, just, it's just becoming possible with, with Bitcoin. Prior to Bitcoin, I don't think it was an option really. So what's true for digital goods is even more true with uh, uh, physical goods because now I, I click on an item on a, an e-commerce site and I'm presented the same way with a, a QR code. But So this time is you're wondering, and then I still need the form because I need to fill out the delivery information. But in fact, you don't because you filled out delivery information in your app, in your mobile app. So why would you have to, to capture your, your delivery information each time you go to a new website and, and want to buy something from that website? You are not moving that often, so your, your address is stored in your mobile app. So now there is a need to uh, make sure your address is not uh, 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 tempered with when you send it to the merchant, because evidently uh, that's a critical security issue. So the simplest way is probably that the way we, we propose is to uh, sign uh, your message to the merchant because in the QR code you have the Bitcoin address, the price, and the email address of the merchant. All three pieces of information are in the QR code. So your application can capture all three information. So all you have to do is really hit OK. That's it. Uh, and Simultaneously, when you are sending the Bitcoin transaction message, the application is also sending a message, sign message to the merchant with your address, and it's signed by the same private key as your payment. So that way, there is a cryptographically secure way of making sure your address belongs to that payment, the delivery address belongs to that payment. So it's it's very simple way to uh, do a one-click payment on any website not just Amazon, because Amazon can afford to register people and people will happily register to Amazon because it's the largest e-commerce website. But you don't want to register to all the websites you go to. The smaller ones should benefit from this kind of uh, setup. So this does not address another security issue is the, the, middle in, the man in the middle attack where um, the address itself is uh, tampered with. And there was an interesting presentation yesterday about that, about. Uh, uh, pay to contract protocols and that kind of thing. So th these things can be combined with uh, the system I'm, I'm presenting here. And lastly, what's true for online uh, purchases can, is also true in the, in the physical world. In the real world, you can have a one-click payment uh, with a QR code that's not displayed by the, the merchant, but that's uh, printed on a, on a media, on a billboard, or a uh, package goods um, and that way you can uh, buy the package goods and, and uh, from or from the billboard with a one-click 
uh, um, action. And that's different from QR codes today are used for uh, pretty useless uh, applications like, uh, oh, I can visit the, the website of the uh, advertiser, which no one has any interest in. Um, but if it's to buy the product, then it, it's becoming a different proposition. And, and with Bitcoin, you have a way to do this because, again, it's a standard, so global standard. So if it's on a packaged good, it makes sense to print the QR code because it's a standardized QR code. You will work in all, all your... Uh, all the countries where, where the, the retailer operates. So it's a, it's a very uh, uh, strong proposition for uh, distributors and, and uh, packaged goods uh, manufacturers. So that's what we call single scan payment. We patented the, the, some of the process I described uh, as a defensive measure to, evit, uh, to avoid uh, a situation where some patent troll would uh, ask us for royalties for, for an idea as simple as that. But it's, it's really I'm mentioning this because we're not too much into patents, obviously. Uh, we, are, we are more copy, copyleft and copyright, evidently, in the Bitcoin community. So. So in a nutshell, Bitcoins, as in the payment sector, Bitcoin technology solves a number of problems. And that explains to me, that explains the success, today's success uh, of, uh, of Bitcoin. It's not only the, the, the currency that's talked about a lot in the media. Uh, I think just as a, as a payment technology, it's, it's just an, an amazing technology. And that's uh, uh, really those two, uh, th those two qualities will make the success of, uh, of Bitcoin in the long run. Um, so again, uh, card fraud is uh, almost eliminated because the, the, the buyer is not exposing any sensitive information to the, uh, on the internet, unlike today's situation where you have to enter your card, credit card information on the internet, and if the merchant wants you to avoid the need to type it again next time you visit the site, then he has to store your bank information, your credit card information, and that's a very costly proposition because then he has to be compliant with something called PCI DSS, uh, which is the uh, card industry uh, standard for, for storage of, uh, of credit card numbers. And, and this standard is very costly and ineffective uh, because evidently it takes only one merchant to get your credit card number uh, uh, to be compromised. So it's a very inefficient way of handling uh, internet uh, e-commerce security. And, and Bitcoin as a uh, native internet technology is really a game changer again for this kind of situation. Uh, privacy protection is also talked about a lot in the media. Um, I think it goes beyond uh, simply uh, the risk of uh, authoritarian government uh, taking advantage of uh, uh, the knowledge of what you buy, uh, what organization you support with your bitcoins, etc., which is a real threat in some countries, but not so much perhaps in, in Western countries for, 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 for now. Um, but uh, it's still a, a threat. But mo more importantly, if, if your data is uh, captured uh, at will by uh, the large corporations, uh, that means your, your transaction data is, uh, is worthless for you. It's, not, uh, it's something that you cannot protect. Therefore, they, 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 there is no value. The value is captured by, by the, this large corporation. If you have a choice uh, as to when you want to release your transaction data, then all of a sudden you can gain more from your, your bargaining power, your bargaining position has changed all of a sudden with, with this large corporation because then you are in control and therefore you can ask for more uh, if, if they want to know more about you, about what you buy, etc. So the privacy uh, protection issue or the, what I like to call the uh, user-managed privacy is, is a real uh, breakthrough uh, that's uh, brought about by, uh, by Bitcoin as a technology. And um, it, it, really, it really should be stressed out as one of the key success factors for, for Bitcoin also. Um, and I finish with this uh, last but not least, the fact that you don't need a pre-existing contractual agreement between the wallet and the merchant. That, uh, that makes Bitcoin a de facto worldwide standard for payments. Uh, I think that's one, also one of the reasons Bitcoin will be hugely successful uh, in the next few years uh, as e-commerce continues to grow and uh, as Bitcoin emerges as the uh, only true native internet technology for e-commerce payment. Okay, that's, that's it for my formal presentation. I'd be happy to have some questions for, from you now.
sort of challenges are there with um, having an account that's denominated in Bitcoin and then having a credit card associated with it that you can spend in fiat and is accepted by merchants that accept MasterCard and Visa, things like that? Yeah, the, ch the challenge is to have a uh, payment institution partner because without it, you are not, as a tech company, as a Bitcoin startup, you are not allowed to issue a card or, or to even issue a payment application. Uh, you have to be uh, regulated because it's showing a fiat currency balance. Right. Uh, if you, are, you cannot show the Bitcoin balance because then you are not in the App Store. <laughs> so you, if you want to show uh, the fiat currency balance, you have to have the uh, banking partner. And he... That balance would float, right, based on the value of your Bitcoins? At some no, no, the, um, the Bitcoins are converted. The, think of the Bitcoins as your savings account and uh, your fiat currency balance is your checking account. So you, when you only, it's only when you convert your bitcoins to top up your fiat currency balance that uh, something is happening. But I see, so you have to keep some fixed fiat currency balance to actually uh, spend out of that account using a uh, credit card? Yeah, until, until you spend your, your balance, your, your bitcoins are, are not are unt left so you, untouched. What's, what's floating is the number of bitcoins you are sending when you pay a merchant. Because right. if the merchant is playing an item at $10, $10 say, uh, this ten dollars will translate to a fluctuating number of bitcoins. It wouldn't be till you actually settle, right? You, you would just use your credit card, then you'd have a debt, and then to pay off that debt, you could trans you could convert your bitcoins immediately to pay that off. The credit card it's a different it's only a top up mechanism for the credit card. I wasn't talking specifically about your solution. I was just wondering in general. In general, if you could have a credit card that is automatically settled using a Bitcoin balance, if there are any like, severe tech -like limitations in the financial system. Yeah, it's, it's, the system is not in place yet for, for credit cards, uh, for MasterCard to uh, treat uh, Bitcoin as a regular uh, foreign currency. So it's not like you are traveling to Japan and you are paying with your card a merchant that's showing uh, an item in yen. Uh, right. It's not the same. And it would just immediately exchange. Yeah, so. it's, it's not happening that way. So you are using it more as a top-up mechanism to first Trans top up your fiat currency balance and use that fiat currency balance to do the card transaction. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had an easy question. You, the irreversibility when you talk about the QR code, when you scan it, if it's a scammer, like you said, they're out there, you think 50 cents for a newspaper article, you scan that bad boy, and the next thing you know, it was $500, and it's irreversible. So what no, the app, the app is showing you the amount that you are sending. What is? Because the, the, the amount is in the QR code. So if, when you're scanning the, the QR code with your smartphone, it's showing you... It'll show what it is. It will bounce. show you the amount. But so if that's ghosted, you know what I'm saying? Or if, you know what I'm saying? If it's a scammer who's ghosting it, yeah. you know, that, you're that ghosting to, 50 cents, but they're actually doing 500. So they yeah. ghost you with the 50 cents, but it's really $500. Right. It's that's, irreversible. So the next thing you know... But our, our back end will, will catch this because this is going through... The transaction is going through our back end. So we'll... We'll, we'll certainly catch uh, something, a uh, discrepancy at this point. You know what I'm saying? Because it could show 50 cents. I, I, but that's yeah. showing only on your mobile app. Our right. back end knows w how okay. much it's sending. Okay. That's a good Thanks. So you were mentioning uh, that, that Bitcoin could be the de facto global standard for these QR payments. Um, what's to prevent the other cryptocurrencies from emulating that or, or say, Litecoin or you know, whatever comes next? Um, so is this exclusive to Bitcoin? No, at, not at all. Actually, you are absolutely right. It can be emulated by any other uh, cryptocurrency, uh, or certainly Litecoin or some stuff like that. And I'd say even PayPal can do this. It, it's not particular to Bitcoin, in fact. But PayPal can do it on, in a proprietary mode, only for PayPal users and PayPal merchants. The difference is with Bitcoin, it's open source and it's open. And anyone can jump on the on the wagon, and, and that's the, the, the key difference. And as far as the other, the old chains, I mean the other currencies, uh, the, the prime is the, uh, the, the, the security of the network uh, and the performance of the network. Is, is their network as, as, as you know, resilient and secure and efficient as the Bitcoin network? If it becomes so, then yes, they can become an alternative. So, so what you're saying is uh, the principal advantage then of Bitcoin is the robust nature of its network. And, and the adoption, because then adoption. you have many wallets, so many users. With all chains, all of a sudden, you are reducing the number of users. You are dividing the number of users by, by a factor of 10 or 100. So for the merchant, it's probably not worth the trouble to, to go through another cryptocurrency. Thank you. Hi, Marco Crispini, Bitcoin Britain. Um, 
Have you had any experience of fraud by having within the eight-day SEPA transfer window by having yes. those transferred? And yes. Yes. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's happened, but it's very rare. We were fortunate that it was very rare. Uh, the fraud came from uh, cyber attacks, not from uh, users uh, asking for calling the funds back after a wire, uh, fortunately. Out of the tens of thousands of wires we received, we had probably less than 10 uh, call, callbacks like this. So it was not significant. I know in the US, uh, the numbers are not as, as good. I mean, the fraud is, uh, for some reason, the, there is more risk attached to a wire. Uh, but we are fortunate so far with, uh, maybe that has to do with the awareness. Not many people know they can challenge the wire in, within this eight day window. So but we don't know. Thank you. Sure. Okay. If there are no other questions, I thank you very much for your attention this morning. And I wish you the best.